Well, good morning and Merry Christmas to you. Hopefully your holiday season is off to a great start. And we do want to welcome all the guests that are here today. We know many of you came to be a part of these special moments. And we certainly welcome you to our fellowship today. Uh, my name is Chad Clifton. I'm the executive pastor here at Midway Church. And I'm uh, just so honored that you're in the room today. We're in a series simply entitled, He Shall Be Called. And uh, last week, Pastor Kevin talked uh, on... Um, uh, God is counselor in our life, and today we look at this mighty God moment that we find in Scripture in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. So if you want to go there, verses 6 and 7, uh, we're going to be there. But I do love this uh, time of year. Uh, Christmas season is very special, but there is a little craziness in Christmas season. Would you agree with that, yes or no? Yes. In fact, just from an outside perspective, if you knew nothing about Christmas and looked at some of the weird things we do, it would definitely make you wonder what in the world was going on with humanity, such as hanging unworn socks over the fireplace when they're already dry. Just doesn't make sense, right? And then eating candy out of those socks. That's even weirder, right? Like, why would you do that? Telling your kids that an old man's going to invade the house one night. Now, nobody really knows how old Santa is, but that, that could freak him out a little bit. Singing, you know, Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen when you really don't know who they are, right? Like you're, you're singing something that's just not true. Most of us guys can relate to this, risking severe injury to, to string up some lights on the house so that the neighborhood can enjoy it. How many of you guys have done that? I know a lot of you ladies do as well. You're, you're heroes at Christmas. Thank you for making the houses look so beautiful. This one's weird, justifying kissing someone because of a plant hanging on a ceiling. I mean, that's like... Especially at work, that's just weird, right? <laughs> Seeking out ugly sweaters. We wouldn't do that any other month of the year, but yet uh, Walmart sells a bunch of them this time of year for those of you who like to wear those. Singing about a grandmother who got stampeded by a caribou. I mean, God bless her heart. That's just horrible to even think about. Telling your kids you bought them a toy elf that spies on them 24-7. I mean, <laughs> what are we doing to our kids this time of year, right? Now, I know a lot of you probably done this, watching a virtual burning Yule log on your television. I mean, all right, we, we've done that. Putting antlers on your dogs, how special. And we hurt our kids again when we wait in the line to put children on an unmasked stranger's lap. I mean, that's just like so weird. Why do we do these things? Because it's festive, right? Now that I've ruined Christmas for some of you, let's go to the Bible for some hope. You know, get, get something good inside our heart here. We love this thought. He shall be called. And Isaiah frames it up so well for us. 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah gives us this moment in Scripture that, that prophesied of who Jesus was and, and who he would be as he came to earth. And these, these verses are incredible for us as we think about this time of year. But I would set it up by saying this, that we, we're definitely enamored with power in our culture. The heroic power in our culture is something that we gravitate towards. In fact, in the last two decades, now some of you may know the exact number of these movies. Uh, these uh, movies. If you do, you may want to get get another hobby or something. All right. But looking online, over a hundred superhero movies have been made since the year two thousand that have been released in the theater. That's with DC, Marvel, and everything in between. So we see the adventures of Superman, we see the adventures of Iron Man, and all these heroes, and they make billions of dollars off of these movies. Why? Because we are enamored with heroic power in our culture. Long before these make-believe stories came to be, the Word of God was written that helped us understand the might and the power of the God we serve. And we see Jesus having a relationship and wanting to connect with his people, but we should be in awe of the power of God. We should be in awe and fear the might of God as it's laid out in the word and what God is capable of because our God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. And we go to Isaiah chapter nine, verses six and seven. Here's what we see. For to us, a child is born, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Again, Isaiah, 700 years before Christ is coming, is helping us understand that one of God's qualities is that he is a mighty God. 
If you look at this Hebrew word, two parts of it, El Gabor is the, the Hebrew word that simply means mighty God. So you get that in two parts, El meaning God. We see that paired with God's name, such as El Shaddai. In other places, we see El meaning God and Gabor meaning a warrior, mighty warrior. And so you put the two together and we understand he's talking about that, that God is a mighty God, that he is all powerful, that he's limited by nothing. El Gabor, our God is a mighty warrior. A mighty warrior who fights for his purpose, a mighty warrior that fights for his children, that protects those that he loves. The idea here is that the Messiah that we read about in Isaiah that ultimately comes into the, the New Testament, because if you're new to the faith and new to the Bible, Isaiah sits in the Old Testament, which is the first part of the word of God. That's before Christ came and that after Christ comes in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see the gospel or the good news, which is the life of Christ. And then after that, acts on into Revelation, we see the church is born and we see even more prophetic statements about what will happen down the road. And I'll get there here in a minute. But we understand that he is a mighty God. This young Messiah that came is not only the wonderful counselor, he is a divine warrior. And here's how I want to connect that with your heart today. If you'll give me that big idea uh, slide there for a second. Here's what I want you to know. When the people of God trust the power of God, they fulfill the purpose of God. There's a lot packed in there, but I, I want your heart to grasp a hold of this today. Because truly, when the people of God trust the power of God, they fulfill the purpose of God. And I don't know if you've embraced that today, but God has a purpose for your life. Oh, there's nothing more beautiful than God's purpose for your life. A divine, eternal purpose that he's working in and through you to use your life to impact his kingdom forever. That is a divine purpose and you fulfill that when you trust in the power of God at work in your life. El Gabor, the mighty God. So a few things I want you to know today. The first one, number one is this. The might of God will never be unwise. As we, as we zoom in on the qualities and nature of the might of God, I want you to know the might of God will never be unwise. Look at the person next to you and say, don't be unwise. Or you could say, don't be stupid. However you want to phrase it, all right? <laughs> don't be unwise. We see leaders in our culture who use their power in unwise ways, don't we? For personal gain, for personal profit, to lord over, to oppress people. Leadership isn't intended to do those things. And God shows us that his might, his power will never be unwise. My, we've seen that in the Middle East as Hamas has used their force to kill innocent people, to destroy innocent lives, to rip families apart, to, to sexually abuse uh, people and to hold them hostage. The power is used in the wrong way and it impacts people's life in, a, in an incredibly wrong way. But the power and majesty of God will never be unwise. In fact, all through scripture, as we see the power of God at work, it is used for God's ultimate, holy, passionate purpose as he fulfills what he alone chooses to do as Lord, as God. But if we zoom in on our life for a minute, I would say this, that each of us have authority over something in our life. It may just be your cat, and that sounds like a simple life, but for most of us, we have to lead someone else. We have to lead not only ourselves, but we have to lead someone else. It may be at work. It may be a classroom of kids tomorrow. It may be your kids in your home. It may just be you and your spouse. It may be somebody else living uh, with you, another family member. But the, the fact is that we all at some point, the majority of us rather, have the privilege of leading other people. And the best leadership model that I can give you it isn't some self-help guru, some other human being, while there are some great leadership books out there, and I've read many of them. But the greatest leadership model that I can give you for your life is found in the word of God as you see God lead his people, as we see Jesus on this earth, as we see Jesus interact with other, uh, other people, human beings on this planet, and how he serves them, how he coaches them up, how he tries to help them be more like God. Ultimately, Jesus is our model for leadership. We find that God's power will never be unwise. 
You think about in your home as we, we struggle and we wrestle through how to lead ourselves and to lead other people. That's why it's important to tap in to the might and the power of God that will never be unwise. Number two, the might of God will never be undone. Never will it be undone. Now we live in a world where things are undone, right? In fact, as we gather for Christmas, some of you have already had that there will be many presents that are returned because they, they weren't the right size, right? Maybe we were a large last year and we forgot to tell them that we've upgraded to extra large this year and so the sweater doesn't fit. It will be undone. On a more serious note, things in our life like our health can be undone. Our bank account can, can be undone. Our job can be undone. Our hair can be undone. Our relationships, we, we understand this in our life because we see it on a daily basis. But in scripture, we see these kingdoms that have been undone. The kingdom of Egypt and Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome at once were mighty kingdoms who did whatever they want with the force they had and accomplished their mission without any restrictions. But at some point, those kingdoms have fallen and those kings have died. Those kingdoms are no more. But praise God, the God we serve, his might, his power will never be undone. Look what Isaiah 9, say, 9 verse 7 says. It says, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no what? No, no end. That's hard to process. Because most of our life ends, our, our time even will be undone. Our life will be undone at some point. But we think about who God is, his government, his greatness. There will be no end to what God does. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, if you want to reference there, I'm not going to show it on the screen, but verses 9 through 11 frame this up for us futuristically thinking about who Jesus is, because again, we're in the Old Testament with Isaiah written before Christ. We're in the New Testament in Philippians chapter two. And Paul writes it this way, that therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, above LeBron, above Jordan, above Taylor Swift, above all the names in our culture that resonate and, and have influence and have social media power, whatever. There's a name above every name. And verse 10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But here's why that's important for you today. Because we have a choice right now. Every king, every president, every leader has a choice right now with this life to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. When someone's getting baptized like you just witnessed, we had some first hour, that decision is saying, I'm here with as much humility as I have. I'm, I'm stooping, I'm kneeling my heart in submission to the lordship and the authority of Jesus Christ. And he gives us that option right here, right now with our beating heart to make that decision. But there were some in our culture that reject that. There are some leaders who refuse to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. And here's what I want you to know about Philippians chapter two. Whether you choose to do it now or you're forced to do it later, we will kneel, we will bow, and our tongue will confess that God is Lord. His power, his power can't be undone. That's why Verse six of Isaiah nine says, the government will be on his shoulders. Now, the first time he came, he came in a humble state. We know that he was born of a, of a simple couple. We know he was born in a simple place. We know that he, he didn't step out of the cloud with the trumpets blaring and the authority uh, that, that would have rumbled all of creation at that point. Why He came to serve. He came to make himself known. He came to reveal the revelation of God to man so that we could connect with him. But the second time he comes, scripture says, he will come as a king. He will come with authority and he will defeat evil and he will bind Satan forever. And there'll be this epic ultimate battle and our God will be victorious. Why? Because his might cannot be undone. Aren't you glad the government's on his shoulders? Because if the government was on our shoulders, we might have some conflict. We might have some scandals. 
We might have leaders who only think about themselves and how they can profit, profit off of, of people and off of, of our, our society. But when the government is on his shoulders, it will be a righteous power that rules forever. His might cannot be undone. Number three, the might of God will never be unavailable. Oh, let this encourage you today. It will never be unavailable. Now, we're familiar with that term unavailable because there are times even in our homes maybe where the power is out, right? The power, a storm comes through. Some idiot was texting and driving and hits a power pole, knocks the power out. We know what that's like in our culture to be sitting there with a turkey in the oven and the power goes out. But I want you to know that God's power, his might is never unavailable. It's never something that we can't find or have access to. In fact, he affirms this even in Luke chapter one, as we go back to the New Testament for a second. But in Luke chapter one, we see this story, the gospel of Luke, this account of, of Jesus's birth. And in chapter one is so beautiful. And I don't have time to read all of it, but you, you definitely should at some point during this Christmas season, Mary's story and her, her song of worship is just beautiful. But we find that this angel comes to Mary, visits Mary in Luke 1, verse 28. And the angel says, greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. How do you get highly favored? The favor comes from God. But we know that God favors people that have a heart that leans toward his passion, toward his purpose. We see that all through scripture. God blesses people that pursue him. And Mary was highly favored. It says something about her life and her walk. And we find that Mary in verse 29 of Luke 1, she's greatly troubled. Would you be troubled if an angel popped in to have a conversation with you? Probably. But the angel said, don't be afraid. Obviously she was. You found favor with God and you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus and he will be great and call the son of the most high and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. Did you catch the connection there? Isaiah said he will rule from David's throne. And now the angel years later, hundreds of years later said he will be given the throne of David. And then we find in verse 34, Mary says, how will this be? Of course, she's a little confused. She's never been with a man. She's found that she will give birth to a son and that it's God's son. That will rock your world a little bit. But look for the affirmation that she gets back from the angel in verse 35. He says, the angel answered to her and said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Don't underestimate this part. And the power of the Most High, the Spirit of God at work in her life, because here's what she faces. This, this unbearable moment that is difficult. It's a big mountain to climb and there's a lot of questions that aren't answered. And imagine being in her culture where, where she now has to tell Joseph that she's pregnant and she's never been with another man. She has to let her belly begin to grow as a, as a lady does when she's carrying a child and she has to walk out in her community and people begin to point the fig, finger and they question and, and they wonder and they, they don't really know what's going on. It was going to be a difficult journey even though she's favored. And the angel reminds her that as you walk through this journey, don't worry. Because you're trusting in a power that will always be with you. You're trusting in a power that is never unavailable. You're trusting in a power that doesn't disconnect because of any storm. And I say the same thing to you today. Because as we sit here, many of us are in a storm in our life. We're in a moment where we're, we're trying to be obedient, but it's difficult. Or we're dealing with the impact of, of some situation that's ripping our life apart. And God is saying, look, as you go through it, you just need to know that as you walk, as you go, the Spirit of God is with you. It is never unavailable. I don't have a lot of time to get into this part, but when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he had promised that when he left, that the, the spirit of God would be 
left with us here on this earth, living in our heart as Jesus went back to heaven. And in Acts chapter one, we see that the spirit has come to this planet. The spirit of God that we've read about, the spirit of God that the angel talked about is now living and dwelling in the people of God all the time. That same spirit as a child of God goes with you when you face trials in your life, when you have a difficult relationship, when somebody walks out on you, when, when, when you can't make ends meet and things are difficult, there's a power that will always be unavailable, that will never be unavailable. I can tell you this, in life, relationships are definitely the most difficult part of this life. I don't know if you've experienced that. Anna and I have been married 25 years. In January, we'll celebrate 25 years here at Midway Church and also 25 years of marriage next April. And I say, I found a hot woman that will stay with me for 25 years and an incredible church that'll be gracious with me for 25 years. She is hot. I told you that. <laughs> you can amen right there. She'll be the first one to tell you. With two people who try to love the Lord, it's still stressful, still difficult. There are still days where we don't communicate well. There are still times where we say things that we regret. There are still times where we have to apologize and emotionally work through things. And that's just, that's just the two of us. That doesn't count three kids and even other people and other relationships that can sometimes be complicated. But human beings are complicated people and relationships are very complicated. Can I get an Amen. Especially at Christmas. <laughs> but as we go, the power of God goes with us. How do we forgive? The power of God. How do we move forward? The power of God. How do we find a sense of humility and humble ourselves and get over ourselves, which I have to do a lot? It's the power of God working within us that sustains us. And the angel reiterated that to Mary. Now I want to shift gears a little bit to tell you what the, the might of God will always be. The might of God, first of all, will always be undivided. The might of God will always be undivided. Our lives are plagued with disunity and quarreling, which I just referenced, but, but our culture is also so divided. Politics is so polarizing in our, our world. The, the opinions are, are different extremes and somewhere in the middle we have to find some common ground to not be divided, but the might of God is always undivided. But here's what's happening in our culture. When somebody makes a mistake, we try to cancel them. When someone messes up or says something we don't like, we blast it on social media and we try to cancel them and we speak out against them and we point the finger. And here's why that's ironic, because you have one sinner trying to cancel another sinner. And in reality, we've already all been canceled apart from the grace of God. So cancel culture is contradictive to scripture because scripture says bear with one another. Scripture says forgive one another. Scripture says, find a way to be unified on what really matters. And when we try to cancel something out, we're pointing the finger and we're saying, you messed up, you sinner. When in reality, we, we've all sinned. Scripture says we've all fallen short of the glory of the expectations of God. And we're all in the same boat. Scripture says, that we all like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah wrote that later in his book. I can make it real simple. Sometimes we're just all dumb sheep who choose to leave the pasture and go out there and look for something stupid when the shepherd's right there trying to take care of us and he comes to pursue us. But yet even, even in Christ Jesus, sometimes we go out there and we leave the, the green pasture because we think something else is greener out there. And Jesus says, no, there's power in my relationship. There's power in what we do. And there's unity if you'll just trust me. In fact, Ephesians 4 says there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He's the only way that we can be uncanceled. 
There's no way that you, you can cancel your own sin out. It's not possible. You're not smart enough. You're not rich enough. You don't have enough influence. You're not popular enough. None of those things cancel out your sin debt. Only one person can, and that's the power of Jesus Christ. Believe it or not, Scripture validates that that's the only way we're made right before God. Amen. His reign is a holy one, but it's a unified one also. I know some of you are guests here and you're checking us out for the first time and we're, we're so glad you're here, but I, I want you to know part of what we fight for here at Midway, we, we strive for unity, we fight for unity. It doesn't just happen. I feel one way one day, you feel one way one day, and we're both passionate about what we believe. But what brings unity is when we realize that the higher calling, the higher purpose is much more important than my personal ambitions and even my personal feelings. And I've got to lay those down to embrace the unity of the mission. We've been called to make disciples here in our community and in our world. We passionately pursue that. And anything that gets in the way, we try to bust it down and keep moving forward with that mission and calling. Are we perfect church? Absolutely not. Are we still learning and growing about who we can be? Absolutely. But one thing you'll find here is a leadership that is unified. Why? Because the might of God will always be undivided. Next, I want you to know this. The might of God will always be unlimited. Look at the person next to you and wake them up a little bit and say, our God is not limited. Thank you. Somebody was dozing off over here and I appreciate you waking them up. I, I love unlimited. Oh my goodness, I love unlimited. I know you do too. In fact, some of you are already thinking about the Golden Corral. I know you are. That unlimited buffet with the fried chicken, the water made mashed potato. No, they're, they're homemade. I'm sorry. I don't want to ruin that for you. Unlimited dessert. Mm. You just wish they made reservations so they have a space for you when you got out of church, right? I love unlimited. In fact, I remember Anna and I got to go on a cruise earlier in our marriage, first one. And uh, I was introduced to unlimited surf, soft, uh, soft serve ice cream. You know what I'm talking about? The, the machine you can go by at any point in the day, just get you and just keep walking. And I, I would find ways to just swing by that particular part of the, the cruise ship. You know, even if it's out of the way, I'm like, nah, I got to go by there because I don't know, I think 20 or 30 a day probably just keep down on those things, right? <laughs> unlimited ice cream. What a blessing. So many things in our life are limited. Our money's limited. Gas is limited. Our health can be limited. Our calorie count is limited, or should be, right? I, I think that that's going to be one of the beautiful parts of heaven is potentially having an unlimited calorie count, right? Because I don't know about you. I started overeating back at Thanksgiving, and I'm still going and Christmas isn't here yet, right? So I'm in that point of like, I really need to get off that bandwagon and straighten things out a little bit. And now you start to see all those diet commercials pop up, you know, ahead of January. So you're trying to go ahead and get ahead of that a little bit. But our calorie count's not unlimited. We, we live in a world as a human of limitations. But God's power is not limited. In fact, we see this word omnipotent, that God is able to do anything. He has unlimited power. We go to the book of Exodus to illustrate this story. Exodus 13, 13. You may know the story. There's this, this man called Moses. And Moses is facing this huge obstacle. God has called him to lead his people out of bondage to help them find freedom, which good leadership helps their people live in freedom. And that's what God is doing here. And in Exodus 13, 13, we see that Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And he said this in verse 14 of chapter 13, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The mighty warrior of our God fights for you. As a child of God, he believes in you. He wants you to be a successful child of God. 
a productive child of God. He wants you to be a healthy child of God. He fights for you on your behalf. Why? Because there's a war that wages for everybody's soul in this room. You can ignore it. You can act like it's not there. You can try to stay up in the clouds, but there is a battle that is raging for the people of God that is so evident in our culture. And as the people of God stood at the Red Sea, and I've stood there before, I can tell you it's not a creek, it's not a pond, it's not something they could have just walked through on their own ability. It's a sure enough sea, and as you stand there, there's no way to get around there, and they're standing there, and Pharaoh and his army are breathing down their neck, and Moses said, don't be afraid, God will fight for you on this day because he's a mighty warrior. And when Moses' staff touched the ground, the seas parted. And the spirit of God dried. It wasn't just the sea. It was the muddy bottom of the sea that they had to walk across. And the the power of God dried it out so that they could walk across the dry ground. Every water molecule responding to the power of God. That's the God you serve. He's mighty. His power His power is unlimited. His power has no limits. He never grows tired. He never grows weary. He never gets busy. He never gets disconnected. Even though you do, even though I do, God's power is not limited. Because when the people of God trust the power of God, they fulfill what? The purpose of God. Here's my last point. The might of God will always be unwavering. The might of God will always be unwavering. God's mission is so clear. It's what I love about the word of God. He he clearly defines for us our mission. That we're called to be disciple makers. Be a disciple first and foremost. Then be a disciple maker. And not just that. We're called to go into all the world in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, making disciples, pursuing our world so that they can discover and receive the power of God. God is unwavering in his mission. Our society changes its mind all the time. What's important? Different leader comes in. The whole agenda changes. But I thought that was important. The whole thing changes. Because a man's mind will will lead himself based on his convictions, based on what he sees or she sees, based on their experience. That's how they're going to lead. God's mission has never wavered in his pursuit for people. His pursuit for your heart. His pursuit so that all nations can worship and experience the power of God. But here's what you need to know. Satan is also relentless in his pursuit. And the word says where there's no vision, the people what? The people perish. The vision shrinks back. But when the people of God trust the power of God, they fulfill the purpose of God. Here's what's incredible about this story. This baby grows up, lives a perfect life, and he challenges all of the religious norms and they hated him for it. Absolutely hated him for it. Don't tell me how to live my life, Jesus. Don't tell me my religion isn't hitting the mark, Jesus. Don't heal on that day, Jesus. Don't hang out with those people, Jesus. They hated him for it. So much that they they drug him to a cross. They beat him. He was unrecognizable. And Satan, Satan thought he had won. Satan thought he had the final word. He thought he had finally overthrown the power of God. Three days later, the power of God breathed life into Jesus and he walked out of that grave. And he overcame sin and death. I think we should clap right there. I think that's a great place to clap. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The power of God was on display. 
And the power of God is unwavering in his pursuit for a man's heart. Unwavering. The mission hasn't changed and it will never change. It's the ultimate display of the power of God that he can help us who are canceled and apart from him and he can breathe eternal life back into our spiritual soul and bring us to life forever. Here's how Paul said it, Philippians chapter three and verse 10. He said, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Do you know? Do you know the power of the resurrection? Has it brought you back to life? And I love what in the book of Matthew, Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus was in this conversation and it said all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet, right? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? Emmanuel means God with us. Connect that back to what Isaiah said in these verses. He said, unto us, unto us a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. Who's the us? We're the us. Unto us, salvation comes. Unto us, a savior came. Unto us, eternal life was available. Unto us, we can be connected to the power of God. When the people of God trust the power of God, they fulfill the purpose of God. Are you fulfilling the purpose of God? Because he pursues you. Even if you don't want him to, even if you don't love him, even if you don't acknowledge that power, the power of God pursues your heart because he loves you so much. In fact, Jesus said he loved you so much. This is Jesus talking that God so loved the world, what? That he sent his one and only son unto us. Unto us. Our God is mighty. His power is mighty. And ultimately, our God is a mighty God who is mighty to save. Will you pray with me right now? If you're a believer, I'm going to ask you just to pray in this moment for those who may not be, but there are some in the room today who I believe the Spirit of God is knocking on your heart. You hear unto us and you want to embrace that, but you never have. The best gift you can give yourself this Christmas season is humbling yourself and saying yes to the saving power of Jesus Christ. And I believe some of you want to do that right now. So I just want to lead you in a prayer. You're not praying this to me. You're not praying to the person sitting next to you. You're praying it to a God who saves you and he hears you. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So as I pray, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer of salvation. God, right now, I'm asking you to save me from my sin. I'm asking your power to infiltrate my heart and set me free and make your dwelling place right here in my soul. God, I thank you for the freedom through Jesus Christ. Today, I'm committing to follow you as Lord and become a disciple. If you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know you have made the most important decision of your life and we believe in next steps here. In fact, we have people that are available right now to have a conversation with you. If you're on the campus, at our starting point wall right to your right outside those doors. If you're online, you can put that in the chat there because we want to connect with you. It's a big moment for you and we believe that there are some next steps that we can help you take and to understand this decision that you have just made and I would encourage you to tell somebody else today. I have one last question for you before we go. How many of you would say, I want to trust in the power of God as a child of God to fulfill his purpose. I want to lean into that even more today. Will you pray for me? Can I see your hands? Where are you at? Anybody? All right. Thank you for your honesty. Cross the building here. Father, thank you for every hand that was raised. And thank you that even now as we acknowledge that we want a deeper connection with you, let our lives prove that today and tomorrow and the next day. As we dive into the power of the gospel, the power of your word that connects us to the power of your purpose, God. 
We love you. We thank you for your word. And we're so blessed this Christmas season and all God's children said, amen. Thank you for listening so well. I appreciate it.